This video describes a new procedure added to Stack Graphics 19 for building decision forests. Decision forests are used to model a quantitative or categorical dependent variable y. Models are based on multiple quantitative or categorical factors. It works by constructing many classification or regression trees. The result is basically the average of all the trees in the forest. As an example, I've loaded into the Stack Graphics data sheet information about all the passengers aboard the Titanic the night she struck an iceberg and sank. I want to try to predict who survived and who did not survive that night. And we're going to consider three possible explanatory factors. Key class, which is the class of their ticket, first class, second class, or third class, and also their sex and their age. Before I grow an entire forest, I'm going to grow a single tree. And I'm going to do that by going to interfaces on the top menu to the section for R, machine learning, and select classification and regression trees. The dependent variable that I'm trying to predict is survived. Key class is a categorical factor, as is sex. Age is a quantitative factor. I'll then press OK and be sure to tell it to construct the classification trees. There are a lot of other options. I'm just going to take all the defaults on the next two dialog boxes and let it grow a tree. Here's the tree that it grew. And I think I'll make the text a little larger. so You can see it more easily. The way you read a decision tree is like this. You start at the top. Take a particular passenger on the Titanic. At the first branch of the tree, it says the best test to divide the passengers into two groups would be to ask whether or not they're female. If the answer to this is true, you go to the left. If it's false, you go to the right. So let's suppose we're talking about a female. We then ask, are they third class? If they're third class, you go to the left. They did not survive. If they're first or second class, you go to the right. And the majority of the people that reached that point, at least, did survive. For males, it's a little different. Males go to the right, and then we look at their age. If they were less than nine and a half years old, you come down here and, again, ask what class they were. If they were third class, they probably did not survive. First or second class, they probably did. If the man was over nine and a half years old, Unfortunately, it didn't really matter what his class was. He likely did not survive. Now, that's a single decision tree. What I want to do is actually build many trees, a whole forest of trees, and come to a consensus from all the trees about which passengers were likely to survive and which were not. Now, there are a couple important aspects to building a decision forest. The first is, when we build the trees, we rely on something called bagging. Bagging stands for bootstrap aggregation. The trees are built by sampling from all the data with replacement. What I mean by that is, every time I build the tree, I'll take the 1,309 passengers on board the Titanic and sample from them. Build myself a sample of 1,309 passengers 
but where I randomly sample passengers with replacement. That means that some passengers are likely to be chosen more than once, some passengers not chosen at all. That means that each tree will be built using different data. The second thing we'll do when we build the trees in our forest is rely on feature randomness. That is, whenever we make a branching decision in a tree, we'll make it based on different subsets of the variables. When I come down the tree and, and need to decide how to make the next decision, I'll randomly select a subset of the variables and make my decision based on that subset, not all of the variables. That means that each decision is likely to be based on different variables. Now, once I've grown my forest, I can make predictions about observations not used to grow the trees. And I'll do so by looking at all of the trees and basically finding a consensus prediction. Now, the basic principle that makes all this work is that a large number of relatively uncorrelated models, relatively uncorrelated trees, and I've tried to make them uncorrelated by using different data and different variables, that if you have a large number of these trees operating as a committee, they'll often outperform any of the individual members. So let's go back now to stack graphics and grow that forest. I'll do it by going to interfaces on the top menu, to the interface with R, machine learning decision forests. The data variables are the same as when I grew a single tree. I have survived as a dependent variable, P class and sex as categorical factors, and age as a quantitative factor. On the Analysis Options dialog box, I need to tell it several things. First off, I'm going to tell it that I want to fit a classification forest, not a regression forest. You do a regression forest if you were going to try to predict a quantitative dependent variable. But here, I simply want to classify individuals as survived or not survived. I'll tell it the number of trees to grow in the forest. By default, that's 500. I'll tell it the number of variables to try at each split. As I said, when I make a branching decision, I won't make it based upon all of the variables. I'll make it from a randomly selected subset of the variables. Now we can use the default of the program or we can tell it how many variables to try at each split. We can specify other things like the minimum terminal node size. That means when you get to the bottom of a branch, all the way down to a terminal node, how many passengers, in this case, must be remaining at that node. We can specify the maximum number of terminal nodes or just take the defaults. Also of a lot of importance is how we define our training set. How do we decide which passengers to use to build the model? By default, we'll use all the passengers in our training set. The training set is the set used to build the model. On the other hand, I could tell it to just take the first half of the rows to build the model and the second half as a validation set. That's often a good idea. That gives you an idea of how much you're overfitting the data. If you fit much better on the training set than on the validation set, then the approach may not be all that great for making. 
I can set some other factors too. That's enough for now. I'll just press OK now. And then I can ask for several things. I think I'll ask for an analysis summary. I'll ask for predictions and residuals. And then I'll ask for a tree diagram and a Pareto chart. When I press OK, it will grow the forest. And in a minute, it will come back with the important information I wanted to see. In the upper right corner, you'll see one of the trees that was grown. This is actually a very simple tree, this particular one. It said you would decide whether a person survived or not just based upon whether they were female. Well, that's just one of the trees. I can go to paint options and ask for tree number two. And you'll see it's quite a bit different. It looks at X and class and age. Tree number three. Different again. Act a much more evolved tree. At this point, it's a good idea to go look at some summary statistics. If I go up here to Analysis Options, you'll see the output returned by R. And right about here are estimates of the error rates. Actually, R defines what's called a confusion matrix. Now, you see a statistic for out-of-the-box error rates. That tells me how frequently I've erred in predicting a number of my training set. We then have a test set error rate. That's a estimate of how often we were wrong about the observations not used to fit the model. Now, we did pretty well on the training set and only about 14% misclassifications. However, on the validation set, that error rate went all the way up to 29%. It's interesting to look a little more closely at the confusion matrix, too. Uh, if you look, for example, at this row right here, it says of those people who did not survive, we made a correct prediction about 226 individuals who we predicted not to survive and an incorrect prediction about 15 passengers who did uh, survive. That's about a 6% error rate. That's pretty good. For the people that did survive, we didn't do quite as well. We predicted that 59 would survive who did not, and 223 who survived that did. In other words, we did considerably better predicting the people that did not survive than predicting the people that did survive. With respect to the test set, you see there's also a difference. We did a little bit better predicting people who did not survive those error rates are considerably larger than the passengers used to fit the forest. There are also two measures of importance that can tell us which of the three variables we were using are the most important. The first is the mean decrease in accuracy. That basically says if we exclude or permute values of a particular variable, how much does the accuracy decrease? The larger the decrease in accuracy, the more important the variable. In this case, sex seems to be the most important with respect to accuracy. There's also a measure of the mean decrease in the Gini statistic. The Gini statistic looks at how often a particular variable appears in, at the branches of the various trees, 
how often is a particular variable used to make a decision, answering decision, weighted by the size of the sample when the decision is made. And with respect to that variable, sex is obviously the most important. Incidentally, these statistics are also shown in a Pareto chart. Here you can see the mean decrease in accuracy or node impurity, that's the Gini statistic, by either measure sex is the most important variable. I'm now going to use my forest to make predictions about other individuals. To do so, I'll go to the data book and I'll go to the bottom of the data sheet. Down near the bottom of the data sheet, I've added some additional rows with information about passengers, different combinations of class, sex, and age. You'll notice that I've left the column survived blank so that these rows will not be used to build the forest. If I now go back to the decision forest window and look at the table of predictions and residuals, I can press the right mouse button, go to pane options, and ask for forecast only. This will find the rows that have no value for survived and make predictions. These are called the unknown set. You'll notice in this table that for everyone aged five, male or female, first, second, or third class, the prediction is that they would survive. For 30-year-olds, only the females are predicted to survive, and that's true no matter what the class, the same thing with 55-year-olds. So I've been able to take my forest now and predict various combinations of class, sex, and age. And I can use that information for whatever purpose I need.